Well, I'll say good morning again. We have special guests here today. We've got the Gehrings, Roman and Vicky, and their two girls. And um, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome them and to invite them, if I, uh, uh, Roman, up to share what God has laid in his hearts today. But while I'm up here, I just want to take a moment as well to, to plug a, a mission moment later in the year. In October, we're having a, a weekend mission weekend. So it's on the 26th, 27th, 28th. So the, Wednesday, the Friday night of the 26th and onward. So I just ask you to give you a heads up and ask you to keep that weekend open so that we can come together and hear what some of our other missionaries can share with us as well. We'll have Hori Sadaka, we'll have uh, Steve Twynham, and also we're asking uh, Bud Fuchs to come as well. So it should be exciting. And we want to see God working and how our missionaries can share with us what God is doing in their lives and excite us as well and create that joy in us that will cause us to go out and share both locally and globally, I pray as well, to share his mission with the people around us in our community. So, Roman, uh, I just ask you to come up and share what God has laid on your heart today. and. Uh, we just thank you for this opportunity that you, you and Vicky can, with your work at Wycliffe as well, maybe you'll share a little bit of an update on that as well, yes. it would be wonderful. Yeah. So. Thank you, again. Tom. Good morning. I don't need to be concerned about this, I think. It's good to be here with you. The first time I was here was approximately 36 years ago, it's uh, kind of hard to think so many years. And uh, I suddenly realized when I, uh, when I uh, thought of this number, wow, I've gotten older. <laughs> <laughs> I don't feel that way, but uh, it's a reality. Um, I would like to introduce uh, my family. Um, they're not all, two of them are missing, but our own children are all on here. So there is uh, my, uh, Vicky and myself. And then next to Vicky is Romaine, our oldest daughter. And then Seth, our next one. And then Mayana, who is with us here, she's the youngest. And Lucas, our middle one, with his fiance Eva. And they are gonna get married next Saturday in Quebec. And so we look forward to that. And then finally, Emmy on the uh, far side. She's also with us. Uh, we have been really blessed by God giving us our five children. And we are very thankful for his work in their lives and how he leads them. And uh, we just give him praise and thanks for that. It was in 1984 at Urbana Conference during my second year of Bible College that I was introduced to Wycliffe Bible Translators. I had never heard of this organization and they had a booth and there was a, an elderly gentleman, George Cowan, who was actually who was a Canadian member of Wycliffe, at some point the director of Wycliffe Canada, but he and his family, he and his wife and three or four children lived in southern Mexico and they did a translation of the New Testament of one of the translations down there. He was my first, the first person that I talked with in Wycliffe who explained some of the things that Wycliffe Bible Translators is doing. To make a long story short, the Lord led me to attend the um, training, sem uh, training um, a whole semester of training courses the next summer and the year after another training semester and from there on the Lord led both Vicky and I into working with Wycliffe Bible translators and we ended up uh, with God's direction in Pakistan we lived for 12 years in Pakistan and after 12 years of Pakistan we're given a letter sent by express post delivered to our home uh, asking us to leave the country. We never found out why we had to leave. 
uh, but we felt that was the Lord's way of redirecting us. We had been living in Pakistan for ten and a half years with the people called the Hazara people. The Hazara people are at home in central Afghanistan, but there is a large community of them in the city of Quetta, Pakistan, where we lived. And so we had the privilege of living ten and a half years, no, sorry, uh, ten, uh, nine years among the Hazara people in Pakistan, learn their language, learn about their culture, and uh, begin doing translation of the Bible with, them, with some of them. The Hazara people are an all Muslim group. However, by today, there are believers, not only in Pakistan where we were and where we lived, but also in Afghanistan, their homeland, as well as scattered around the world in many different countries. God is building his church even among the Hazaras as well. And it is by his spirit, by his power, that he is calling individuals here and there. And slowly they are finding their way to the Lord, but also to come and meet each other and recognize I am not the only one who has found the truth in Christ. That's the amazing thing. When we first started, there was a children's prayer book. It's about this big. It was from A to Z, one page each letter. And each page represented or uh, explained one people group or a language group in the world from A to Z. And the letter H had the Hazara people featured in that book. It was a book about people groups that had no Bible, no scriptures whatsoever. And now we can share with you that we are close to uh, finishing up the New Testament. We have four more books to work through, the translator and myself, and then a number of readers. And we have uh, another uh, five books that are completely finished from, through our team, but they have to be consultant check, checked through an um, a expert in Greek and Hebrew who is able to check our translation as for accuracy and faithfulness, but then also to check whether it's naturally translated for the people, the recipients, to uh, be able to understand it. So this is exciting for us. It's, it's hard to almost believe that after so many years working on this, we are actually coming close to this milestone. Not finishing the Bible, but finishing the New Testament and Pentateuch, as well as Psalms and uh, Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. It, we hope that we can achieve that by the Lord's help by about the end of 2000, yeah, 2020, so in about two and a half years' time. That's our goal, and we pray that the Lord will lead us, enable us, give us the means, and uh, support us uh, so that we can bring this to completion. To give you something of a statistic, there are over 7,000 languages in the world, 2,639 active Bible translation projects throughout the world, and Hazaragi is one of them. So we are very privileged, together with you and a number of other churches and many individuals, to have a part in giving God's word to one people group. I would like to say that, I would like to say thank you for praying for us, especially in the last four years, four or five years, one prayer request that has been answered is the fact that our main translator and his family have been able to join us in Canada. They lived in India as refugees and through a long tortuous way the Lord led us to find people to help with sponsoring them into Canada and after four and a half years of waiting Finally, in February 2017, they were able to come and join us in Kamloops. 
So thank you very much and praise to God for making that happen. Because being able to live and work together in the same city and meeting regularly makes a huge difference as far as the progress of our work and the progress in the translation. So we're very grateful for that. The other prayer that has been answered is the driver and co-worker that uh, has been a co-worker of ours for over six, uh, 17 years now. He was in jail for two years, not in the making of his own, but he happened to be in a bad situation and he was picked up and thrown in jail and he was labeled with certain things and he had no way to prove himself out. And so we, we are thankful to be able to report to you he is back home with his family. And I would say from all that I've been able to hear him explain, his faith has matured and been strengthened all the more, despite the very difficult circumstances that he was in for two years. So we are grateful and we give the Lord thanks for that. Our vision for the next two years, we call it Vision 2020. Uh, so by the year of 2020, we hope to have the New Testament, the Pentateuch, Genesis to Deuteronomy, and the Psalms, which, in which I lump Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes. Why these three uh, portions or this selection? Among Muslim cultures, they often refer to the, script, to the scriptures of the Christian as the law, the Psalms, and the gospel. They don't know all the parts of the Old and the New Testament. They don't label them the way we do, mostly because they don't read them and they don't understand the content. But they have this, this understanding about the law, the Psalms, and the gospel. So we felt led by the Lord to uh, try to work on these portions and to finish these so that we can print them as well as digitally publish them and give them to the people. So pray with us in the next, uh, especially two years, two and a half years, that the Lord would uh, guide us in this and in all that needs to be done. Now, we include the law very, very purposefully, not just because they, the Hazara people, understand that to be uh, a portion of God's holy word. Actually, I must say, the Muslims, they believe that God has revealed the law, the Psalms, and the gospel. The law was revealed to Moses, the Psalms were revealed to David, and the gospel was revealed to Jesus. They believe that. So there is some common ground that we have to share with them. So that's very good. They don't have the same understanding. And they also do not view the crucifixion in the same way we do. So there's a lot of holes that need to be filled. But at least there's some common ground. Now, the law is important. Muslims live very much in a legalistic or in a law-structured society. They have Sharia the Islamic law, which is based on the Quran and the traditions and the sayings of Muhammad. Three sources, not the Quran alone, but these three sources. So they understand law. In fact, when we translated Exodus, and I had one man from the villages read Exodus through with me in a few days, over and over again he would say, wow, these things we understand because we still do this in our villages. Let's see, there is a, uh, uh, there is a legal dispute. They come to a clergy person. The clergyman will look at their law and he will look at all that's involved and then make a decision based on law. It's all an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth and all these things. They're completely at home with these. For you and I in Western uh, in, Western, uh, in the Western world or uh, North America or Europe, it sounds very foreign oftentimes, but to them, it is very natural. So we believe that 
the law is important. Think a moment for a moment about the uh, passage in Deuteronomy. Um, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and mind and soul uh, in, the, in Deuteronomy chapter 6. And he talks about binding the law on your hands and putting it as frontlets. It's actually saying not on your forehead, but between your eyes. So I see that as a lens that God has given to us. Whatever we touch, whatever we do with our hands, and whatever we look at with our eyes, we ought to do it and we ought to see it and understand it as through God's law, God's perspective. He wants us to be filled with what he has revealed to us. And that includes Leviticus, believe it or not. <clears throat> Expressed in a different way, <clears throat> perhaps, we can also say we should take every thought captive to Christ. That's from the New Testament perspective. In the Old Testament, look through everything through the lens of the law, but in the New Testament, take every thought, and with our thoughts begin our looking and begin our uh, doings. Take every thought captive to Christ. Now Leviticus, I thought, okay, what kind of a title to give to a book like Leviticus? Living in God's presence, I thought, was a, not a bad representation of that book. The title of the book Leviticus comes from the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, of the Hebrew Old Testament, and it just says about the Levites, which is somewhat true, but it isn't just about the Levites. It's about the Levites who do the service in the tabernacle. It's about the priests who are Levites as well from the tribe of Levi, but it is also about the common people. So we'll just talk about this in a moment. So I would say living in God's presence is also a good way uh, or a good title for the book of Leviticus. In Hebrew, the title is, And He Called, because that's the beginning uh, of the first chapter. And the Lord called Moses and spoke to him. So oftentimes they take the first word of the book and that becomes the title of the book. Why did we choose to do Leviticus now and not after the New Testament is finished in our translation? It's always a, a bit of a, a prayerful concern. Which book to translate first? Which book to translate next? And how do you go on? What's your, what's your strategy in selecting the books that you translate? Uh, we started with the book of Luke simply because somebody wanted to do the Jesus film and they were going to do it in one month and be done with it. And we thought, there's no way they can do an accurate job in one month. That's impossible. So they asked, would we help? And we said, yes. It took us more like a year and a half. Uh, but we, we were very grateful that they invited us to partner with them. And we we're very grateful with the outcome because the Jesus film has been viewed by thousands. I don't know how many thousand, but uh, there is, if you look at YouTube and you can find the Jesus film in Hazaragi, there's like 60,000 hits. Not everybody has viewed the whole movie, but they have seen parts of it. And we just praise and thank God for that. So why Leviticus? Because Leviticus has a lot of terms. Priests, sacrifices, atonement, and a number of things uh, that resurface in the New Testament, particularly in the book of Hebrews. And so we did first Leviticus in the last two years, and then followed by the book of Hebrews. And that is also because we need to make sure that the terms we use in the different books line up and are the same. We can't do the book of Hebrews, choose terms, then later on, after publishing the uh, New Testament, come to the book of Leviticus and realize, oh, wait a minute. For this, we have a different word or a different term, and we should 
have chosen a different term. If you've already published, then you've got a difficult job of fixing that. And that's why we wanted to do the book of Leviticus bef before we did the remainder of the New Testament. And this was, uh, we were encouraged to do so based on another or some other teams in Central America who had experienced that doing Leviticus first was a great help for the New Testament. Now, I want to put the desert or wilderness experience of the Israelites into a little perspective for Burlington. I just looked up the population of Toronto next door. Population of Toronto is now approximately 2.8 million people. The census of the Old Testament, the numbers, comes with a figure of 633,000 men between the age of 20 and 50. Now there are some older ones and there are some younger ones and there's also all the women, girls. So it is estimated that the Israelites when they came out of Egypt were a group of approximately two and a half or a little more, a little less million people. Just think for a moment, the city of Toronto packing up and saying, we're gonna go on a camping trip and the distance would be just slightly more than from here to Ottawa. And we're going to camp at Parliament Hill. And we're going to do some worshiping the Lord there. And we're going to arrange ourselves in camps all around. Just imagine what that would look like. The whole city of Toronto packing up, going on a foot, on a walk, with whatever they could carry. That's what the Israelites approximately looked like when they came out of Egypt. One big difference was they went through a desert. There was no water. We have lots of lakes and rivers and creeks from which we can take water. They had none. They completely relied on the Lord to provide for them. Leviticus is episode number two of the Exodus uh, experience or the exodus uh, of the people of Israel from Egypt and on their way to the promised land. The first one was coming out and then crossing the Red Sea to the point where God called Moses to the, to the top of Mount Sinai and he gave him the law. Then he came down and according to the instructions that God gave to them, he built, he had the people of Israel construct a sanctuary. The Lord said, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them according to, the, to all that I show you. That is the pattern of the tabernacle and the pattern of all its furnishings just so you shall make it. And they did. They collected all the things they needed. People brought freely what they had and to the point that it was too much and when it was all done and all finished, set up, that's when at the end of Exodus in chapter 40, we read, God came into the sanctuary in the form or in the, uh, in, in the cloud, during the day visible as a cloud, at night visible as a pillar of fire. It was an awe-inspiring event for the Israelites. In fact, it was so awe-inspiring when they were at the foot of Mount Sinai and there was thundering and lights, lightning flashes. The people were downright scared. And they said, don't let God speak to us, Moses. You just go and talk to him because this is too scary of an experience. So Moses went up to the mountain for 40 days and God spoke to him and he related everything that God spoke to him, to the Israelites. Now, in, whereas the book of Exodus is mostly, uh, it's the history of them coming out of Egypt, but then also a description of this tabernacle and of the laws that they were to observe and it was um, a description of how the priests were to dress, 
how the priests were to act to some, uh, in, in some areas, in some things, uh, about a few things about sacrifices, and how it was built. Leviticus, on the other hand, is not a description of the tabernacle, and it is not a description of the Levites either. It is, a, it is more an instruction of how the Israelites were to live in God's presence. God said, I am holy. I want to draw a few thoughts from a video clip that, I, that Emmy, my daughter, from her Old Testament courses, learned from YouTube. And I encourage you to go to YouTube if you are a user of computers and find the Bible Project. The Bible Project has some amazing insights in very few words on some of the portions, I think on all of the portions of the Bible, all the books. And I would like to just look at what they say on the book of Leviticus. The book of Leviticus shows something about God's holiness, God's awesome power, God's presence, and how that is to affect us, or the, at that time the Israelites as worshipers, his people. God's power is so pure, and, or God's presence is so pure and so holy and so powerful that it's actually dangerous to come into his uh, proximity. How is it dangerous? It was said in chapter 10 of Leviticus of Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, that they took their respective fire pans and after putting fire in them, placed the incense on it and offered strange or other than requested kind of fire before the Lord, which he had not commanded them. And fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed them, and they died before the Lord. I cannot imagine that that would leave me unaffected. And it did not leave the Israelites unaffected, but they were struck. If God is so powerful and so holy, how can we ever live in his presence? It's so dangerous. But God gave them a system of how they should behave. So could we have that slide that uh, I gave you? This is a very simplistic, not watertight kind of a diagram of how the book of Leviticus can be uh, divided and how the structure of Leviticus roughly is. Yes, chapter 1 to 7 and chapters 23 and to 27 is one block. And it mostly, or quite a bit, it majors on some rituals. It majors on the rituals of the sacrifices. Sacrifices included burnt offerings, peace offerings, fellowship offerings, sin offering. And these offerings were meant for the worshipers, the Israelites, to bring them to the tent of meeting where the altar was. And there was a prescribed manner that these things were to, these uh, sacrifices were to be brought. They couldn't just come any old way and say, here I am, Lord, take me as I am. Yes, in some way, take me as I am, but on the other hand, there, were very clear, there was very clear guidance of how God wanted them to come. And Tom read that for us from chapter 4. The priest was to take uh, an animal. It had to be an unblemished, clean animal. Then when he brought the animal, the person who brought the animal in front of the priest had to lay his hand or... Uh, um, stroke his hand over the animal to identify with the animal. And then the animal was slaughtered and some of the blood of the animal was taken by the priest to, and, and applied to the altar. So there were all sorts of things that they had to do with each sacrifice. These things were done every time a sacrifice was brought. It wasn't a one-time thing. You brought a sacrifice. Okay, now, Lord, I'm good. 
every time there was a, tran a transgression or every time they felt I'm out of sync with God how am I going to become right with God they brought an animal to sacrifice not only that once a year they had the atonement about which I will talk a little bit later and not only the common people but the priests too for their own sins had to bring sacrifices now not all sacrifices were for sins some of them were to say thank you to the Lord or to have fellowship with the Lord so there were different things but they were nonetheless rituals with they, which they needed to do over and over again in the Western worldview, for you and I, sacrifices are not common anymore. We might think of a sacrifice uh, when, oh, I give up drinking coffee for the month of Lent, or I give up doing such and such for whatever purpose, and afterwards I say, yeah, it was a bit of a sacrifice. We make sacrifices of this nature, but we don't think in terms of animal sacrifices anymore in Central Asia and in the Middle East in the Islamic uh, world and in African in African world and some Asian place uh, some other Asian countries they still have animal sacrifices so the content of Leviticus bringing an animal and sacrificing an animal isn't strange for them so if you meet somebody here from the Middle East and you want to explain to them the Old Testament, don't be surprised if they know about sacrifices, perhaps quite a bit more than you might. And they're very familiar with it because they do that on a regular basis for certain festivals and for certain purposes. One of the things they also do is they bring an animal where they will slaughter it and they will stroke with the hand over the animal to identify in some way with this animal I'm not absolutely sure how all the people take it they take it in different ways I am I understand that some people think of it in terms of an, an, an atonement or uh, in a sense that through this sacrifice our sins are forgiven I don't believe that is uh, official Islamic teaching but in the minds of people, it is there sometimes. So when people offer these sacrifices, they do very much similar things as we read in the book of Leviticus. So they're very familiar with it. All rituals are not empty. Um, I'd like to read just a dictionary definition of ritual. A ritual is a religious or solemn ceremony consisting of a series of actions performed according to a prescribed order. So sometimes we look down on rituals and we think, oh, that's meaningless because it's just done in rote and that it's not really important. However, even we as evangelical Christians have certain rituals. Uh, I like to sometimes think that uh, our worship services uh, have a little bit of a ritualistic tendency because we tend to do structure our worship services from Sunday to Sunday quite similarly. So in some ways we can look at that as a ritual too. We pray in front before every meal. That's a ritual. It's a good ritual. It's not bad. It's, it's very meaningful. And we, we can look at rituals and fill them with meaning in order to approach the Lord. But this over and over kind of a repetition to do these sacrifices, who can do that? And the festivals, over and over, every year the uh, Israelites were asked to do the Passover. In chapters 23 and following, it talks about the festivals that the Jews observe, had to observe. And so the Passover in particular involves also a sacrifice. Now, when we come to the New Testament, we read in 1 Corinthians that Christ is our Passover. And he was slain once for all. Not only that, 
he was a sacrifice once for all. So now I'm coming to the second block. Chapters 8 to 10 have some parallels to chapter 21 to 22. These are, have some uh, emphasis on the priests and what the priests had to do and the way they had to do it and just to recognize that priests were held more strictly to these laws than the common man. Priests had to, for example, when somebody died, they couldn't touch the dead person because as soon as they touched the dead person, they would become unclean and they were no longer able to uh, perform their priestly uh, duties. And the same was true with Levi's, but certain persons were able to do that, then they were unclean, and then they had to go through a cleansing ritual, and then they were reinstated as clean again and pure. So the priests and the priesthood were something very special that God had ordained, and it had to be done in a certain way. The priests weren't free to just act the way they wanted to and make use of their position for their own purposes or for their own benefit. In fact, if we read in Samuel, in 1 Samuel, it talks about Eli the priest and his sons. And his sons were, are labeled as evil people because they treated the sacrifice of the Lord and the, service of the, Lord, uh, uh, the services of the Lord with contempt. And God eventually took them. Priests were, from generation to generation, the position of priesthood was passed down from father to son. It can be a good thing, it can be a negative thing. If the young priest took it seriously and accepted it as a responsibility given by the Lord, it was good. And if he had the fear of the Lord, it was good. But if they acted like Eli's sons, it was bad for the people. And the people were led astray. As Christians, we look at the priesthood of Christ. It says that Jesus, although he was not of the Aaronic line or lineage, he was not a, descend a descendant of Aaron or of the Levite, uh, the tribe of the Levites, he was designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. He was a high priest forever. Hebrews chapter 5 and 6. And this high priest of ours understands our weaknesses, for he faced all of the same things as we do, yet he did not sin. He was, he was deemed faithful to God who called him. This is what we read in Hebrews. So Jesus was a high priest, became the high priest for us. He didn't have to go again and again into the, high, uh, into the tabernacle, into the Holy of Holies to bring the blood of animals, but he went once on the cross. His blood was shed once for you and I so that the requirements for purity and cleanness were fulfilled once and for all. In fact, not only that, Jesus is our high priest, and in an extended sense, Jesus makes us priests in this world. Peter talks about the believers being a kingdom of priests, of which you and I, as believers, are part. So if you look at your neighbor who does not know Christ. If you look at somebody at work, a fellow worker who does not know Christ, consider yourself a priest. A priest installed by God to minister the teaching of Christ to your fellow man who does not know him yet. The third section is regarding purity and cleanness chapters 11 to 15 and 18 to 20. Um, 11 to 15 especially talks about the 
meat of certain animals being clean and of certain animals being unclean. And there are all sorts of names in there that really, to us, are um, in the translation, it is very, very difficult. You look at 10 different translations and you will find different names and you go to different languages, you will find different names of these animals. It isn't really, uh, um, what shall I say, it isn't really that important perhaps for us today which animals exactly were clean and unclean, but the fact that some were considered unclean is important. And then in terms of relationships in chapter 18 to 20, some relationships are pure and clean, and some relationships are out of bounds. And God tells us, this is okay, this is not okay. Because God wants a people that is pure and holy. And so certain relationships are not okay. Even, the ho even if the whole society around us says, whatever we say, whatever we want to do is okay, in God's eyes, it is not. And he holds us to his holiness standard because he wants us to be a pure and holy people. Lepers and people with certain sicknesses, certain, uh, yeah, let's just say that, uh, that way. People who had certain sicknesses or had, were in a certain bodily situation, they were also considered unclean. And sacrifices were also asked to be brought to the uh, uh, tabernacle so that this person who had a sickness, if to be reinstated to the, peop to the, uh, uh, to the uh, population of the Israelites, if to be reinstated to worship the Lord in purity and holiness, they had to bring a sacrifice and go through certain rituals. That too were requirements. And again, if we look at what Christ Jesus has done for us, we see that Jesus um, entered the greater and more perfect tabernacle in heaven, not through the blood of goats and bulls, but through his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. He offered himself without a blemish to God, cleansing our conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Hebrews 9, as Tom read for us. And in Peter, we also read, you were redeemed with precious blood as of a lamb unblemished, spotless, the blood of Christ. You and I can look back to the Levitical priesthood, to the Aaronic priesthood, we can look back on all those requirements and we realize that the Israelites, though they were forgiven when they brought a sacrifice, but we all realize when we sin, it is not the last time that we sin. When we go the wrong way, it's not the last time. While we are in this life, we are beset with sins. And yet Jesus, our high priest, gave his life once and for all. And he entered the greater tabernacle, not the one in the tent, which was a shadow of the heavenly one, but he entered into heaven at the right hand of God, making intercession for us. And he came to cleanse our conscience, to put something new into us, to put a new life into us. If anyone is in Christ, he's a new creature. Behold, all things have passed away. All things have passed away. All things have become new. Being in Christ made us new. Being in Christ makes us acceptable before God. Not because of anything we have done or do or can do, for there's nothing that we can do, but only on the merit of of Christ's work on the cross on our behalf. So the book of Leviticus is uh, a book that has many symbols and pictures about Christ. Now we come to the center. The center is chapter 16 and 17, the atonement. 
Once a year, the priest, the high priest, had to enter the Holy of Holies. That's the only time of the year that he was allowed to enter that holy, the, inner, the most inner part where the box was, the golden box, with the cherubim guarding or uh, over, overshadowing it. And there was the lid of the box, which was the place where atonement for their sins was to be made once a year. And inside the box were, was a copy of the law and the, uh, uh, the bud of the uh, almond uh, thing and uh, a little jar with manna as a sample, as a reminder of what God had done for them in the wilderness. Now, the high priest came once a year. First of all, before he was allowed to enter, he had to make atonement for him and his own family. He was not immune to sins. He was just as sinful as, as everybody else. So he's a pastor. So he's a missionary. So he's a Bible translator. We're all on equal ground before the Lord. He is holy. We are not. But coming into his holiness, we recognize that when we come to him and when we come in Christ, we are accepted. Jesus entered that holiest place in heaven. And he entered it with the blood that was shed on the cross. In the Old Testament, following the sacrifice that the high priest made for himself, there were two goats. One goat was to be brought and sacrificed. And of the blood, the high priest took into the holiest place and applied some on that, what is called in many Bibles, the mercy seat. The mercy seat, this expression is actually uh, an expression that Martin Luther came up with. It's simply the place or the lid of atonement or the atonement thing, you can call it in Hebrew. And the word in Hebrew, uh, kafara, means to cover, and in related languages, the word means to ritually cleanse, or in some it means to wipe away. These are words that, we, that are still actually understood today. We know if a sin of ours is wiped away, if our conscience no longer accuses us, because Christ has taken it upon himself. At the time, the Hebrews, the Israelites, brought the sacrifice. They had to do it once a year. And it was almost like a general amnesty, in a sense. Once a year, okay, we're clean again. We're pure again. We're okay again for another year. But it had to be done over and over and over again. And for Jesus, it was the once and for all. I'd like to read from Hebrews chapter 7 as well. In 26 and 27, it says... It was fitting for us to have such a high priest, holy, innocent, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens, who does not need daily, like those high priests who offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins, then for the sins of the people, because he did this once for all when he offered himself up. I am thankful today that I can look to the cross of Christ and apply his sacrifice to my life. Now, what I would like to say is this. What can we learn from Leviticus, from all this sacrificial system and how it relates to Jesus? Think of the picture, you yourself bringing an animal into this church. Maybe if there was an altar here and an, an animal was brought to be sacrificed, it would be in your stead, in my stead. Legally, because I transgressed against the Lord, there is no other remedy than blood. Because in the blood is the life. And my transgression 
removes me from God, from a holy God. And the only way I can be brought near to God is through the shedding of blood. That's what Leviticus 16, 17 teaches us. And God inst instituted this sacrificial system because he wanted to have fellowship with his people. He wants to have fellowship with you and I. But if we had to bring ourselves, he could no longer have fellowship with us. He wants us to live and have fellowship with us. So if we were to bring this animal, what would we do? As in the Old Testament, we would put our hand on the head of the animal and go over it, and in this way, identify with this animal. This animal is to be slaughtered in my place. Now transport that into the New Testament. Jesus was sacrificed on the cross for you and I. What we need to do is lay our hand on Jesus and we need to identify with him. That's the only way we are made right with God and can live in his presence. And that is done once, but we keep uh, bringing this back to our minds. We keep reminding ourselves what Christ has done for us. The one goat was slaughtered and the other goat was taken. The other goat was called the scapegoat. In some translations, they just take the literal word from the Hebrew, the goat for Azazel. Nobody understands what this really means, that name. Some think it was perhaps for the, the um, demons of the desert or the uh, demons, uh, yeah, certain demons, but it's, it really is not clear. But the more important thing that is clear is that this goat was literally loaded up with the sins by placing Aaron placing the hands on the goat and then a man who was ready to take this goat took it out of the camp a certain long distance away and that goat would bear away the sins of the people away from the people away from the camp so that they know our sins have been physically removed in Psalm 103, verse 12, we say, as we read, as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. The goat is a clear picture again of Christ. Just as the goat took away the sins from the people, so Christ has taken our sins away, far away, not to return. And in the time of the Israelites, we have to remember, first they lived among the Egyptians for those 400 years, where they were surrounded by temples, uh, temple worship, and a different way of worship, different gods. They had all sorts of statues. We can see that on the hieroglyphs and the paintings that are, uh, have been found by archaeologists. They worshipped all sorts of gods. But the Hebrews were called to worship one God only. When the Hebrews came out of Egypt, they had to be taught to worship this one God. It didn't come automatic. When our children are born, they have to be taught about the Lord. When we come to Christ first, we have to be taught about the Lord. It doesn't come automatic to us. And it's a, a constant effort to try to learn and to try to give ourselves into the hand of the Lord. It doesn't come naturally, but the Lord gives us the strength to do so. In Peter, we also read, if we address his father, the one who impartially judges according to each man's work, conduct yourselves in fear during the time of your stay on earth. I think the book of Leviticus and Exodus and Numbers are books that ought to teach us something about the reverence before God, before a holy God, and the fear before a holy God. 
who can actually snuff one out in the moment of time. We mustn't ever forget that. He doesn't want to, but he can. So it is good for us to have a healthy respect, reverence, and fear before the Lord, but not a fear that would drive us away from him. Isaiah had an encounter with the Lord in the temple. And through that encounter, he became a new person. There are many other people throughout the Old Testament who had personal encounters with the Lord. And in that way, God made himself known to these individuals. In the New Testament, we are taught that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through him. Each one of us is called on to have an encounter with Jesus Christ. And when we encounter Jesus Christ in our own lives, knowing that I'm a sinful person, I need someone to save me and bow my knees before him and ask him to make me new. That is when my heart is changed. That is when the Lord writes the commandments and the laws not on stone tablets, as in the Old Testament, but on our hearts. That is when the sacrifice of Christ is applied to myself, not just to everybody else, but to me. If you have not had that personal encounter with him today, I invite you and I urge you, don't delay. Ask the Lord to lead you, to forgive you, and to take charge of your life. I want to tell you that the people for whom we translate, the Hazara people, are no different than you and I. They may be from an Islamic background. They may, be from, they may have different experiences in life than you and I. But basically, all of us have the same needs. We have physical needs for food, shelter, clothing. We have desires for our families to live in peace. And we have a desire to live at harmony with each other, but also to have a desire, uh, a, a desire to have harmony with God. Now, there are a lot of people today that uh, think sin uh, is old kind of uh, wife's tale and old teaching, old, old religious things that are no longer relevant in life. But deep down inside, there is a time when each human being is confronted with the living God sooner or later. And whenever we hear God's word, we are confronted with encountering the living God. And so I believe that just as we have had an encounter or just as we are spoken to by God's word, so are the Hazaras and all other ethnic groups. And we need to pray, continue to pray and ask the Lord that through his spirit, he would address different ones. You pray for people that you don't know. You pray for us. Some of you didn't know us before today, perhaps. And some of us do and have prayed for us even though we're far away, you don't see our faces personally, you don't, you don't talk to us, and yet you remember us. And in the same way, you can pray for Hazara people whom you have never met. God hears your prayers. I urge you, continue to pray for God to build his church among the Hazaras. He's at work. More people are coming to know him. And just to tell you, in, our, in, in June, when we uh, worked through Leviticus and Exodus and some other portions for checking, verse by verse, we needed a reader. We had no reader. So we prayed for months. Who are we going to have and find? Where are we going to find this person? And in the end, it was a person in India whom we knew. He'd helped us before. And I asked him, uh, would you be willing to 
Give your time at night when we have day, because we're 12 and a half hours different. Uh, would you be willing to give time to read these portions? And our translation consultant can ask you questions and then discussions and talk through. And he said, I would not only be willing, I would be honored and very thankful if I can again participate in this work. Here's a man who didn't know the Lord 10 years ago. Now he knows the Lord, and through his testimony, his father has come to know the Lord. And we pray others will come to know him as well. So it is God's work among you, and as you enter a new phase in church history of Pineland, Pastor Kevin is going in a different direction, and I understand Pastor Nathan is also going in a different direction. And you will be praying and asking God for direction, where to go from here, what to do from here. He will continue to guide you. It's not you who started this church. It is he who started this church. It is not you who called yourself to be here this morning. It is he who called you to be here this morning and every Sunday to worship him. It is he who keeps you, but keep your eyes on him. Come to him in a holy fear and submit your lives to him and he will guide you and lead you. Thank you, Father in heaven, for the many beautiful pictures that we see from the book of Leviticus. Though we do no animal sacrifices today and we look to Christ, his sacrifice is far greater than all the animal sacrifices combined. His sacrifice is complete and clean and purifies us in conscience and body and mind. We give you praise and worship. O oh Lord, we are unworthy to be your servants. We're unworthy to follow you. We are undeserving of your forgiveness. The only thing we deserve is punishment. And yet you have seen it fit to make a way so that we can come to you through Christ Jesus. How thankful we are and we give you praise. The fruit of our lips, the fruit and sacrifice of our lips we offer you today. Lord, cleanse our hearts over and over again and renew our mind to have the mind of Christ, to have the Spirit of God residing in us and telling us in which way we should go day after day so that we may live in your presence with joy, with gladness, and overflowing into the lives of our fellow men, our neighbors, our fellow workers, our friends who do not know you. Lord, I thank you for these people, and I thank you for each one who has come this morning, and I pray that you would meet with them in the still, small place of solitude, either to renew the covenant with you, or a first time commitment to the covenant in Christ Jesus. We give you praise and thanks for all the work you do in us and among the Hazara people, and we commit ourselves to you from here forward again. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus. Amen.